Okay, all right. I'm going to leave this on for a while. You should be okay like that. Okay. I want to welcome everyone to the Learning Clinic on CKLU 96.7 FM. I'm your host, Bob Kerwin. And this afternoon on our show, we have a couple of guests that are really dealing with um, education. Uh, Kevin Kugler is the Executive Director of Partners in Research. He's going to be with me for the first hour. And we have Ryan Cooney, who is the Executive Director of uh, Canadian Youth Golf Alliance. He's going to be with us at 1 o'clock. Kevin, my understanding is that Partners in Research is a registered charity. Been around for a while. Since 1988, according to uh, the internet. And your, your main role is to try and help Canadians understand more about the biomedical research and 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 your interest in getting involved in the schools and, 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 and education is to help people understand some of the careers in science, technology, engineering, math. So I'm going to try to let you give us the executive summary from the executive director of this Partners in Research program because I know you're, you're involved in a summer program up here in Sudbury as well that we want to talk about. So. Kevin, what's the executive summary of the <laughs> Partners in Research? <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for inviting me to uh, come and talk to you today, Bob. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I appreciate the offer. So, Partners in Research was started in 1988, and it was kind of the dream child of a few prominent Canadians. Margaret Atwood, Ben Wicks, Peter Burton. Yeah, they're prominent. Yeah. <laughs> and at the time, uh, the presidents of the University of Western Ontario, University of Toronto, and the Toronto General Hospital. And what they were trying to do was to create an organization that would convey how health research is being conducted in Canada and get the information out there about why health research is important. And so over the years, they uh, created and uh, uh, developed several educational and academic programs to, to be able to accomplish that goal. And then a few years passed, and they decided to broaden the mandate. And so the mandate um, of Partners in Research today is to try and find ways to stimulate the interest of students in the K-12 system about career opportunities that are available to them in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematic fields. And to do that, we run several different academic programs, not the least of which is the summer camp here in Sudbury that you're alluding to. So the, the careers in science, uh, technology, engineering, math, I, I have a math background. I, I, Took my first year at University of Waterloo and graduated from Laurentian in math. And uh, I did some tutoring through the Women Clinic, uh, and, and we found that the maths and the sciences, in particular, were uh, there's almost like a math anxiety mm -hmm. and a science anxiety that's built into young people, uh, and it's it it seems to be that. The people who tend to get into the careers that involve the maths and the sciences are, they, they find it easy. It's almost like they, they have natural talents in that field. It is part of your uh, program or part of your mandate to try and, and, and encourage, uh, I guess, the, the erosion of this anxiety or, or develop some interest in what some of the promising careers are? Well, we don't target uh, you know the anxiety no. in particular. Uh, it's kind of hard to do, but there there are kind of subsets of that that are interesting phenomena that we have to deal with and we come across. For instance, um, traditionally for decades, it's been hard to get girls interested in science in particular. Right. Um, even though, of course, there's thousands of women uh, across Canada that are in science careers in one form or another, but we find you know especially in the younger grades that girls are just as interested in science as boys, but something happens once they get to an older age, grade eight, grade nine, into high school, where boys, for some reason, are more drawn to the 
the science instead of girls. Um, I don't know what the reason for that is, and I'm not sure anybody really does, but something happens along the way that says, you know, uh, either convinces girls that they can't do it or it's not appealing to them or what, what it is, but we don't try and solve those situations. What, what we try and do is create an environment where girls and boys and their teachers can bring experts into the classroom live through video conferencing and hopefully through that interaction with some of our most renowned scientists across Canada that those interests are re-sparked, if you will, or just re-energized. And in our wildest dreams, if there's a, a young lady out there who's 14, 15 years old and, you know, they get to talk to somebody like Julie, you know, uh, Payet, who's a Canadian astronaut, and somehow that gets her excited into engineering or science, then, you know, we've accomplished part of our goal. The, uh, the, the medical field, biomedicine, what is it about the field that, that for, for whatever reason, uh, seems to maybe not appeal to females? Because it is, I, uh, my uh, nephew's wife is, is, uh, is in the biomedical field down at St. Michael's Hospital, and, and she's coming up to the Ranch Hospital for a while. And, I mean, I, I can't even describe what it is that she's doing, but she's yeah. she's kind of like a uh, put it this way that she will be the only one in Northern Ontario in her field. Yeah. It's kind of like a research for uh, um, microbiology for for diseases and, and, and things like this. And long it takes a long time to get qualified, but anyone who's going through a program, you've got a career that is guaranteed. It's just that they can't fill those spots. Are you finding that is, is happening with the engineering, the technology, and, and, uh, and the sciences? Well, we don't really get into those metrics too much, to be honest with you. Um, we know that there are definitely gaps that occur, and you know, why are some areas needing more women than other areas? Don't really know the answer to that, uh, to be honest with you. I'm finding they're, they're needing males, too. Yeah. Like yeah. there's a shortage in this field, isn't it? There is a shortage, and there will, um, and there's going to be a shortage for some time until we get more students that are entered into these. I mean, when you have uh, places like, um, you know, Sonova, Southern Alberta, um, you know, who are crying for power engineers to come and work for them, um, you know, it's and they, you know, they, they come to Ontario, they mm -hmm. come to all provinces in Canada to try and, you know, encourage kids to go into those engineering fields because they have a shortage. Um, the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, uh, SAIT, has a uh, partnership with um, oil companies in Alberta specifically so that they can target students that are within those institutions to try and encourage them to go into those careers. So there is a huge shortage. Wow, and an engineering, an engineering training program takes about four years, doesn't it? Uh, I would think so. You, yeah, you, at you've got to have about four years before you get your actual certification. You've got to be working with people. Yeah. Yeah, so even finding people who are time to mentor and coach the new graduates must be uh, must be tough. It's challenging, um, and that's one of the areas. That's one of the ways that we can help too is with the mentoring. In some of our programs, uh, you know, we can have a um, uh, an engineering mentor who will work with a class for an entire semester or an entire year. A um, good example is that is the uh, Canada Robotics Challenge. Uh, it takes place. Uh, it's late winter or early spring, if I'm not mistaken, every year. And uh, we've had uh, mentors who are engineers who work with the kids and answer questions on how to build robots and things of that nature. And from there, you know, those students can, uh, they're either in a robotics club or it's part of their you know, curricula at the, uh, the school level. And from there, they can build their own robots and go into the Canada Robotics Challenge. So that's kind of one of the roles that we can play is uh, you know, that mentoring role. So your your experts, I'm, I'm really interested with the the, the uh, experts that are used uh, in, in the video conferences. You've got quite a few of them mm -hmm. in, in your resource base, don't you? Yes. Yeah, we have a few hundred. A few, few hundred. Kit. Yeah. They're hard to get. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like you've accumulated <laughs> quite a quite a group, though. Yeah. It, it, what do they do? If, if a, let's suppose a classroom teacher wanted to discuss a particular topic uh, and they wanted to have 
uh, someone video conference to uh, share their experience and, and kind of motivate the class in this particular topic. What, what would happen? What would they do? There's a few ways that they can uh, participate. First way is, let's say you have a teacher out there who you know just wants some information on what it's like to be a civil engineer. Okay, so as an example. So they would um, call our office or access our website and they would put in a request and they would say on this day, at this time, in this official language, because we do both French and English, we would like a civil engineer to come into our classroom virtually and talk to the kids about what it's like to be a civil engineer. And we would make that happen. So. What does that mean? We would make it happen. Sounds great, but there's an actual uh, awful lot of work that has to happen mm -hmm. on the back end in order for that to take place. So, first of all, we have to have the civil engineers in our database. So, who do we partner with, you know, to find civil engineers? Well, there's a lot of them at universities. Yeah. So, we partner with a lot of universities across Ontario and, and Alberta. And we have civil engineers then that we've gone in person, sat down with, and told our story and what we're trying to accomplish and they've agreed to volunteer their time, so they now appear in our database. The next step is we have to make sure they can technically participate. So they have to have some type of a solution that allows them to virtually connect with the classroom. So just to make that easy, we have our own technological infrastructure that we provide at no cost to any expert who wants to participate in the program. So it's kind of like a Skype connection, um, yeah. only it's uh, little higher advanced than, than Skype. And more of a private connection, I guess? That's right, yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's kind of an, I don't know how technical you want to get, but it, not too much, okay. <laughs> well, no, feel free. I, I, <laughs> well, it goes into the world of video conferencing, and so, uh, you know, the uh, the standard is called H323 or SIP, so they have to be H.323 compliant or SIP compliant. And it's just a fancy way of saying that if you have one brand of video conferencing unit and I have another brand of a video conferencing unit, we can both talk to each other. So it doesn't matter who makes it, yeah. the standard is inside and we can talk. It's kind of like how a Toshiba laptop can talk to a Dell laptop. That's some type of idea. So then we have to make sure that the IT departments of those institutions will allow that video conferencing connection to take place. So we have to do a lot of testing and sometimes some working with those departments to ensure that that happens. Once we do that, um, then we bring the expert, in this case the civil engineer, together with the teacher, and we have a little conversation, and we say, okay, what are you trying to accomplish in your classroom? Is it just a you know half an hour or 40 minutes to bombard the engineer with some questions, or does it tie the curriculum in some way? So do you need the engineer to come up with some slides about you know what it is that they do and appropriate for that grade level? That's where we kind of step out of it at that point, Bob, because we're not pedagogical experts or education experts. So we allow that communication to, to happen. We bring those two parties together. And from there, they figure out what's going to work best in the classroom. Because every classroom, of course, is unique. So it's really a collaborative planning approach between the teacher and the expert. Absolutely. Very much like you would do if you had a, can't say if you had a live person in the classroom because the person is virtually live. Yes. They're coming in as a video conference, but, but very much as if you had a person coming into your room and, and you were going to be planning the lesson, what you wanted to accomplish. That's a little bit different than what most guest speakers do because most of the time you book someone to come into the class, they come and they speak to the class. And I know as a teacher, a former teacher, you're really not sure what they're going to be saying. Mm -hmm. You're giving sure. them a topic. That's right. Or if it's going to be appropriate for that age level. Right. It's, it's yeah. kind of like you're listening and you don't have a seven second delay. So so this really means that there's a, a real um, objective and goal to the lesson. It sounds like there is a lot of work. Though. There's, there's a lot of preparation. So I guess once you get a school connected the first time and they allow that video conference to take place, then it must be it must be also set for any other teacher that in that school that wants to use the same. It is, absolutely. Yeah, we. Um, yeah. But of course, we're stuck with the STEM subjects. Right. I shouldn't say stuck with. We're not stuck. Oh, with those them. Are we embrace them. Very important <laughs> subjects. Yeah. yeah. So uh, those yeah. are subjects that you have to dig to find good resources. On. That's right. Yeah, and that is a challenge. So I mean, we um, uh, now sometimes we do uh, some subject matters that go outside of those those areas. Uh, I was a math major. I don't think there's any subject area that 
is not connected to math. Exactly. Yep. So you get <laughs> or it. science. Yep. You get it. Is that what you get? Yeah. And you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, you talk about you know going from one teacher to the rest of the class uh, or the rest of the uh, the school, if you will. Right. And that is really part of the secret because you know, you, teachers have X amount of time in the day, right? And they don't have anything more than that. No. So it's completely different when they get an email saying, hey, we've got the greatest program since sliced bread. Why don't you take part in this? Yeah, sure. You know, whereas, <laughs> you know, Bob, you walk, you teach yeah. next door to me, and you come over and say, hey, I just did this yesterday. This is really cool. Yeah. Give it a try. you got to try it. Yeah, and that's, so you'll find schools that have a ton of engagement because they've had some success yeah. stories, and then you'll have schools that have zero engagement because right. no one's taken a flyer on it yet. you got to penetrate. Yeah. And you only have to penetrate with one classroom, exactly. really. That's exactly right. To have. Yeah, that's good. No, it, it really, like, like this becomes a, a, an excellent resource then. And I, I guess when a person goes to your website, they can see the, the variety of experts and topics that are available. Yes, so they, yeah. they have an idea of whether you can address their particular concerns. And that's just a matter of making connection and saying this is what I'm looking for. Is someone available? Exactly. And, and it looks different everywhere. Like, to use an example that's uh, unique to Laurentian University, so there's a researcher here by the name of Dr. David Lisbray, and David is francophone, but he is a mentor for a grade six, seven, eight class up in the Okay. and he's been doing this all semester. So in this particular case, it's not as much tied to the curriculum as it is trying to create experiences for these students to give them a reason to come to school. They have a big challenge up in New and the big right. challenge is that, you know, they have other things to do, and the, there's some cultural sensitivities and some social, um, you know, problems that uh, that occur. And one of the biggest ones is that kids just can't get kids to school. So David has been phenomenal. The very first one I watched, though, had nothing to do with education. It was, hi, my name's David. I'm a frog expert. This is what I do. I think, if I'm not mistaken, he showed a few frogs on the, on camera, and uh, and it was magical because the uh, the students on the other end, well, they don't have frogs up there. Oh, okay. Frog, frogs don't exist in the Arctic. I guess they would <laughs> at least there. So I think, uh, and one of my um, um, my uh, my staff was telling me this morning the story of that that first session there saying that, uh, you know, David had said, well, just go down to your local pond, you know, next time and, and pull out a frog and tell me a little bit about it. And they said, well, we don't have that. So, you know, it was, so it wasn't just him teaching them. They yeah. were teaching him yeah. about their climate. And so then the conversation morphed into, you know, what, uh, what's nature like there? What are the animals that are unique to the Arctic? And, and so we had this cross-cultural exchange, if you will. Yeah. Um, and so David has done that, I believe, for six uh, six sessions over the past year with that particular class. So it's just great because the kids look forward to it, you know. Uh, they get to know the expert on the other end, and uh, at the same time, there's some education that's happening as well. No, I think it's great. And, and the thing is, you have access to these guest speakers who really only have to take half an hour to an hour out of their day. Yeah in order to do this. Yeah, and they could do it over the internet. Yeah. Imagine if you had to throw them on an airplane. Yeah, it uh, was, uh, and, and that's always, that's always been the drawback in, in, in getting these experts to come into the classrooms because for a person to come in and do one presentation, they're giving up an entire morning. Yeah. And in many cases, they're strapped for time as well. So. It'd be a hard sell for the university too, right? Right. Uh, we want to send 10 of our researchers to the Arctic to talk to one class. It's yeah. going to cost you $50,000 yeah. to do it. Pretty tough. Yeah. This must be a, a trend that more and more people are starting to use as opposed to the old fashioned day of going out and spending your day in a school and talking live. Well, I'll tell you, uh, um, I think it is a trend. I think we're at the forefront of it. I think we're helping to lead the trend. There are other organizations in the world that do it. I think there's one in, I think it's Switzerland or Sweden called Ekerna. Uh, they're fairly um, well adopted in, in that environment in the United States there's another organization called the CILC um, in Canada there's there's basically us there I, I was gonna say you're, you're, you yeah. don't have a whole long list of no I people mean, are doing that they're called content providers and there are museums out there that do offer you know one hour um, you know kind of a lecture 
Um, Science North is also getting involved in it as well. I was uh, had breakfast this morning with Nicole Chachon, and uh, she's one of the program directors there, and they're doing a little bit in this space as well. Um, but we, are, I think, are kind of unique in that we're able to pull expertise from a wide variety of sources, whereas all of the rest of them are just pulling it from their own institution. So we, we definitely have a role to play here. But, um, oh, there was a story that I wanted to tell you here. Oh, yes. So you talked about, you know, it being widely adopted in the classroom. So just, just to give you an example of how far we've come using myself as a, uh, as a guinea pig. So in 1985, I was in grade nine, and that's um, kind of at the time when HIV AIDS was just starting to come out in the world and be, be a little more well known. And, uh, and I come from a small town called Norwich, which is population 1,700 if you count the cows, right? It's, okay. it's pretty small. And I was asked to do this, uh, this science project on this, this new disease. And I didn't know where to go for information because I went down to my school library and there was nothing there. So now what do I do? Well, nobody in the school knows anything about it. Why didn't you use Google? Why am I Google it? <laughs> exactly. No, thank you for dating me, Bob. Uh, <laughs> there was no Google. So, you know, what do you do? Well, my, my, uh, my parents got in the car and we drove to the nearest city library, which was 30 minutes away up in Woodstock, just for one school project. And even then, there weren't any textbooks on this yet. No. You had to search the periodicals and biker fish. And remember those days? Yeah. So, you know, and I was able to get some information that way. but. Think about how far we've come. So that was my experience, and now all the kids have to do is look at their computer. Sure, they can Google it, but if they go to our website, they can instantly connect to that person who's doing cutting-edge research on HIV/AIDS. So it's transforming the way we learn yeah. in a classroom, as you say. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, when they instantly connect, are there video archives? Are there vi there's videos that are on the site too. It's not just a live conferencing, right? That's right. There's dynamic and static content. Okay. So if, if they happen to catch, these are busy people. So you know, there's sometimes it happens where the, the researcher is uh, is in their lab actually, you know, doing research. How dare they? Mm -hmm. You know, they should be talking to students yeah, all day long, right? Yeah. Right. But uh, you know, if that happens, they can send through a request and set up a, a reach of convenient time, or they can access our video archive, Iraq video. And uh, quite often there'll be a video there that answers some questions as well. Well, I th and then you're also now touching on this this video virtual researcher on call, this video on on demand. This I, it, it seems as if there, there's a real and it's a it's a fast movement. It's not a slow movement like it used to happen in the eighties and nineties. Yeah. Like things happen very quickly. Yeah. That we've got to this generation. And, and I don't even like to say it's the younger generation because I think the older you get, the more quickly you want things to happen too. Because <laughs> it, you, you know that your hourglass is starting to run out. And so you don't, I, I don't talk in terms of 10 year plans in my lifestyle. <laughs> I mean, three or four year plan is, uh, is a long term plan for me. And so I feel that, that, that even when I'm getting into my age bracket, baby boomers, we are so connected and so we, we identify so much with the younger generation that wants everything now 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 that uh, I, I don't even think that this is a youth phenomenon I, I think this this whole idea of I want to be able to access this information I want to be able to get it in an educational format so that I can understand it and if it's being addressed to elementary and secondary schools it's going to be understood by everybody I, I, I and I I know that this is true because I've, in the past, I've done uh, uh, publications on golf and, and hockey and, and very simple publications and nothing complex, nothing like the magazines, but they were on local golfers in the suburb area. And I used to tell people that, yes, the, the, the publication I put out was black and white and it was tabloid and yeah, you would get ink on it. But I said, it doesn't matter if you're Arnold Palmer or Tiger Woods or a person who plays once a week. If it's about golf and you're passionate about golf, you're going to read it. Mm -hmm. And so if you're addressing a topic that is at, the, at a level that is understood by uh, students in their, in their elementary and high school area, the experts are going to read this as well. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they're going to, yes, they're going to have a, a clearer understanding, but it just means that it's confirming the importance of what they've been studying. Because quite often, the more expert you get in a particular topic, you start to forget what it was like 
before you were such an expert and just refreshing some of these concepts gives you better insight into how most people are viewing your topic. I think I think this this video with this researcher on call is, is, is great. The opportunity of video conference with an expert uh, will have that appeal to a classroom because it's different. And it's still different enough to this generation that it is unique. Five years from now, having a person come on conference to you might not be as, as exciting because it's commonplace. That's when you're probably going to get into your, uh, oh, what's the term for it? These, uh, these actual 3D images, holographs. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Being like, which I know that they can do now. So, I mean, where you are right now is such appeal, has such an appeal to the education community that it, it, it just seems like the potential for growth is exponential. How, how can you do this? <laughs> What's yeah. the next step? Because well, you, you can't, you're, you're not going to be able to receive, as more and more people get accustomed to the resource, it's going to be, there's going to be more of a demand on the people at the central office to make all the arrangements to put people together. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and we are a small charity, as you know, so we only have X mm -hmm. number of people and limited resources to be able to pull it off. We try and scale growth um, as our first answer to that question. And that's tough in this generation. Oh scale boy, growth. yeah, because there's there's no boundaries anymore. No. There's no geographical boundaries. No. You know, where's the furthest request you had for a conference? Well, we're doing something in Dakar. Yeah, I figured right now. I figured it wouldn't be just on the side of. You know, the so ocean. but uh, you know, as a as a Canadian charity, right now we're able to limit in our engagement. So. Uh, we don't really have a mandate that goes beyond Canada, so anything we do outside of Canada, we have to run as a pilot project. So we do one school in Dakar just to see what it's like. Mm -hmm. You know, what are some of the challenges about going transcontinental? Or, we're not sure, but we're, we're working with that right now. Um, but even within Canada, I mean, how many, what's the population, 35 million or something like that? I mean, it's, I know it's the size of California, but it's a big, it's a big okay. country. Yeah. So there's a heck of a lot of students here, so how do we reach them all? Well, quite frankly, we, uh, we cap growth. So. Um, we try and do it province by province. So we started in Ontario, and it's free for the schools, everybody in Ontario. Not everybody is using it, of course, so what would happen tomorrow if all of the teachers called us and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. they bring our program to a standstill, right. <laughs> quite yeah. frankly. Nice problem to have, um, but uh, yeah, that's what would happen. And, um, you know, and so then we moved into Alberta. So every time we move into a province, we have to go and we have to talk to some key people to find out, okay, can we grow this in three separate silos? So we have our research community supported by the colleges and universities. They're the ones with the content. Will the K-12 system support it? They're the ones that you know, have to say that they want it in order for this to work. Right. And uh, you know, technology, do we have some strong technology partners behind us that will help us grow our infrastructure at the same time to support this? And so far we've been able to manage it. But to your point, absolutely, if I started getting calls from teachers all across the country, we would have to limit uh, connections you know, based on funding in those regions. Or come up with a different way. Yeah. I mean, we've had some calls in BC, and we're able to engage some teachers in BC right now, but we're not, uh, quote unquote, out there in British Columbia as a, uh, as a province that we're actively working in. We do a few pilot projects there. Yeah. That's about it. Again, I, again I, I, I've had a career in education, and I'm a school board trustee right now, and, and there is this, there's this tipping point where at some particular point, it grows, you know, a few teachers here and a few teachers there, and maybe one school, two schools, three schools. But when it gets to a, a certain point, it spills over now into the entire system. Yeah. And once it reaches that that tipping point, it will be exponential. And and now it's it could that could happen in a number of cities at the same time. Yeah. And and so it, it it's. Uh, I mean, it is one of those things that I think all businesses today have to have to hopefully uh, be ready to deal with it. Like you say, it's a nice problem unless it gets so overwhelming that you can't meet the demands and then everything implodes on itself again because absolutely they, they can't get what they're looking for. So, uh, very nice problem. The um, the STEM program, the STEM camp, mm. is something that you also do with partners in research. 
Can you t explain a little bit more of that step gap? Because there's one here in Sudbury, isn't it? Yeah, it's the first time in Sudbury. Uh, that's why we're here this weekend. We're promoting it. Uh, but this originated, I remember my uh, director of special projects, Brent Peltzla, and I were in Alberta. And we were on a, I think it was a tour. We were talking to the uh, universities and getting them to, uh, to join the program. And we were on that drive from Edmonton down to Calgary. And if anyone's ever been on that road before, there's a, it's a very straight road and it's a very boring road, um, with all due respect to the people in Alberta. So whenever Brent and I get on those, uh, those drives, we have uh, all of these crazy ideas that come to mind. And this is when this one happened. And we said, you know, it's, we love the VROC program the way it is right now, but it's limited. It only reaches students during the academic year, and even then only in select months because well, you know, as an educator, Bob, like you don't want to see an outside organization in September. Um, September is very busy in the classroom. You don't want to see them in December because that's Christmas. January's exams. February's the start of the new semester. Yeah, there's about two weeks in the fall, two weeks in the winter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you know, we have uh, you know maybe five months a year that we're actively engaging students in the school system. So what could we do outside of that? And and you know, I came up with the idea. Well, let's let's try a summer camp. Um, there are a few reasons that we liked it. One was we were able to reach more students. Second is we were able to engage more experts over the summertime. It's, uh, yes, they're on holidays, but a lot of them are still around working in their labs. So that was a great story to be able to tell you know, universities like Laurentian who are partnering with us. We could say, you know, we uh, were able to engage your researchers X amount of times during the year, but uh, we were able to do some in the summertime as well. So it, more engagement means you know the more uh, they get their name out there, and the more they uh, you know like they you appreciate just, it. They just connect with their laptop from home, couldn't they? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, the second reason we liked it is when we work with the education system, we're not the driving force behind the connections. The teachers are. Right. And with a summer camp, we're the driving force. So we're managing the camps. We know what kind of activities we run, we want to run, and where to go to get those experts. So. With those two uh, fundamental concepts uh, in mind, we decided to start the, uh, the summer camp. So we, we started with two last summer, one in Woodstock, one in London. And we picked London because that's where our head office is. And we were very, had very strong relations with, the, uh, with Western University. And then we picked Woodstock because, well, quite frankly, that's my hometown. Mm -hmm. And so it was quite easy for me to kind of keep an eye on things. And, uh, and that seemed to work quite well. So we started with those two locations, ran for two weeks in each of those locations, and it was just incredibly well received. So, uh, you know, and, and from week one to week two, kind of the word got out there, and we actually had to start turning people away because we only maxed out at 20, 20 spots for the camp at the time. So, uh, and the nature of the camp is exactly the same as the B-Rock program throughout the year. So to give you an idea, uh, a couple of the things that we did we had uh, tomato seeds that came from space that were germinated on the space shuttle and they came to our our camp and the kids got to plant these and bring them home and you know we had an autograph picture of Bob Thirst one of our uh, you know Canadian astronauts and he personally autographed every single one of these for all of the kids which was phenomenal so that was you know a highly impactful day so we do things like that so it's and then over video conferencing, of course, we would bring in, you know, a space expert, so an astrophysicist or an astronomer or somebody like that, and they would talk to the kids about, you know, space. So how fantastic is that? So we thought, well, this is working really well, and we don't really want to take holidays ourselves because we're a charity, so hey, let's just, uh, you know, let's open this up and go crazy mm -hmm. in the summertime and uh, expand to uh, 10 locations. So now we're doing 10 locations. Ten. And uh, one of them is here in Sudbury, and uh, we're running it for four weeks in July, so we're pretty excited about that. And where's it going to run? It's at the Parkside Center downtown, uh, okay. part of the YMCA building there. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's pretty central. Yeah. The um, people running it are local? Yeah, so we hire locally. Um, we had to drive up for this weekend, it's a five-hour drive for us, of course, and uh, you know, limited budgets and all of that. So. We pledge that at every location that we're running a summer camp, we are hiring all of the staff from that community. So if you're listening to the show and you want a job, let us know. Good. Um, the promotion is going to be through the schools. You say how many? 20 per week? Uh, 40 per week now. We 40. doubled it in size. Yeah. Um, so you can handle quite a few students then. It's, it's one week programs for each one? One week for each one, so 160 kids in total, or uh, you, you can send your kid for all four weeks if you want. The activities will be different every week. Okay. 
put uh, cost wise? Is it uh, two hundred dollars uh, yeah. per week? And there's yeah. some subsidies available as well if you need them. But it's a, it's a, it's a different kind of program though. Um, I know my uh, eight year old granddaughter took a, a one or two week course at our program that I think was Science Northwest. It was science. Yeah. And we were quite surprised. I mean, her, her older sister, just by two years, she took a, a dramatic arts summer school oh. program. And, and here this grade one girl wanted to take science camp. Which was, I mean, one of her friends got in too, but it was, it was interesting, different. You don't yeah. you usually hear a grade one girls wanting to go to science camp. Yeah. Which is, so I, I thought it was unreal. That's like, what so we're trying to do. And I had a great yeah. time. Um, so, so that's good. So, I mean, so now you're up to 10, you're, you're, you're promoting. Are, are you finding, because we're, we're almost running out of time, are you finding that the, the science, technology, engineering, mathematics careers are starting to attract a lot of people that are more in your age bracket, mm -hmm. that are looking at shifting careers now, or they're looking at, uh, at second careers when they get into their late 40s and 50s as opposed to uh, uh, just straight, this is what you want to do, you find out in grade 10, this is what you're going to be gearing your pathway for. Because I'm noticing that there's quite a lot of uh, career shifts in, in the population today. People that find out that the career they got into when they were in their early 20s is not quite the career that they got into in their early 20s. It's changed so much that... Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, because I uh, just used myself as an example. I, uh, I graduated with a music degree. And I'm just about as far away from music yeah, right I, now. I don't <laughs> so think you can uh, get too much close to this. Although, I've yeah. talked to some musicians that tell me there's a lot of science <laughs> and math and everything in music too. Yeah, and I've also been told that if you're good at music, you'll be good at math, but I can tell you that did not transfer to me. Um, so, uh, it's kind of interesting that I'm running a science-based organization now, uh, according to my parents. But, uh, um, you know, it's funny. I, you know, I went from music to... Uh, as an administrator at the McMaster University, went from there to the IT field, um, you know, started up a couple companies and went from there to, you know, this project. So, and now I'm in science. So, you know, to your point, um, and I'm, I'm not an anomaly, like there are no. people that we have in our office that, uh, you know, they're on their fifth, sixth, uh, seventh career. Yeah, well, let me tell you, the colleges, uh, the colleges more than the universities, but the colleges where it's very skill specific. Oh, I'm sure the percentage of, uh, of what they used to call mature students is quite significant yeah. at these colleges now. It's not your 18 and 19 year olds that are walking the hallways. No, that's exactly right. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, I've had to talk to, with a lot of the presidents and vice presidents from colleges mm -hmm. over the last few years and they tell me that their average uh, demographic by and large is high 20s. Uh, because a lot of them, you know, um, according to the colleges, I'm thinking of Centennial in particular, told me that they have um, a ton of students that go to university and then realize that they can't find a job for whatever reason in that particular career field. And so they come back and they get some practical training at the college. So that's kind of where the, you know, the colleges are picking up a lot of people these days. And it's going to take it into the career. Yeah, yeah. Not that we're having any uh, impact on that at all, I don't think, because uh, we don't really work too much in that space. But, uh, yeah. No, well, you're dealing in a, in a f number of fields where there is a shortage. Mm -hmm. That basically, if a person is willing to move to where the jobs are, there should be jobs. Indeed. But I, I think when you get again, you get into the engineering field, and you get into some of the the science and health fields. Just graduating is kind of like the beginning of your training, and, and that's where um, that's where you put your textbooks to the side, and you you find out now exactly how you have to work with this particular company and, and I think that's really the mentoring and the apprenticeship is coming uh, becoming so important so so I, I can see where uh, as as more and more people find out about the benefits of these particular careers and I guess the the opportunity as opposed to just the fact take it so you can get a job then you're gonna, you're gonna find out before long that you may not have that aptitude for or don't like it or don't like it yeah it's a long haul to, to get there and find out you don't like it after you've got all that training 
kind of expensive too. And expensive. <laughs> but but I think that this whole idea of providing an outside the classroom resource for teachers is, is huge. And, and the way of doing it is um, like it's it's unique enough that it would motivate students. Um, this, the, the information that you're providing through the experts is all available. Like if you Google any one of these topics, you're going to have pages and pages yeah. of links that you can go to. Right. If, if you had to put, put your hand on, on the one particular advantage or a couple of main advantages that people are, are citing as, as uh, why they prefer going to partners in research, what would it be? You thought about it? Oh yeah, abs absolutely. Um, well, I'll use a, I'll use kind of a silly example for you. So at uh, at camp, one of our um, activities is building a lightsaber. So that's great. You can download how to build a lightsaber, you know, off the internet, right? You can Google it and, and try it out at home. That's great. But what if you were at camp and you were building a lightsaber and you got to talk to Darth Vader? I could go so on with that, that but so it's that interconnection. It's, it's that the interconnection. interpersonal. Absolutely, it's yeah. the and it has to be impactful, right? I mean, if you have a speaker that, you know, is is not dynamic, is right. not energetic, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, especially on the age, you know, you might think, oh my goodness, you know, that that career kind of sound, sounds kind of boring, <laughs> right? So you have to be really careful yeah, about who you're putting in front of these kids. Okay, you're uh, getting the wrong message. Yeah. yeah. So isn't 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 it odd now that the, the internet, which most critics have. Uh, have stated is destroying our interpersonal relationships <laughs> is now actually using it to enhance it and strengthen interpersonal relationships on, on a much broader scale that yeah. um, it, it's I mean where it's going who knows well I hope that's the case that's uh, yeah. you know, we're trying really hard to do that Bob. yeah but we missed anything that, that we want to mention about partners in research or the the virtual researcher on call or the STEM camp that you can think of. With this, um, this interview will also be on the Learning Clinic in video form, so I'll make sure that there's a there's a link to the website where people can actually get all the information that they that they want. Um, but uh, it, it is a it's an exciting program. I, I I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that your your four weeks will be filled because uh, this is one of those that, that because it's new there will be a lot of students that will want to take it yeah. for the fact that it, they want to be one of the first ones to have an opportunity to, to engage in it. I hope you're right. We, uh, we spent the day at the, uh, is it the Caruso Center downtown? Yeah, the Caruso Center. Yeah. There for Family Fun Day and uh, there must have been uh, you know a couple thousand parents that came through with kids so we had yeah. some really good response there. That was a good, that's a good, uh, good time to be that's great. <laughs> around Sunday. That, yeah, the Family Fun Day is, is it's an annual event that draws a lot of people. Well, that was great. And one of the activities we had at the table was uh, DNA extraction from a strawberry and a banana. And uh, I had a, a real kick out of showing the kids what that looked like. And uh, oh. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. Well, I know you've got to run. You, you've got a tight schedule today. So Kevin Kugler, uh, Executive Director of Partners in Research. Uh, sounds interesting. Uh, and the program sounds interesting. I know you're going to be hitting that tipping point before long. It's, it's uh, going to be interesting to see how this program progresses over the next three or four years. It's uh, be my challenge, and if you're uh, if you're in government out there and you want to get behind this, uh, <laughs> dial me up because we're we're looking for ways. Yeah, <laughs> I can I can I can attest to that. Well, thanks for inviting me today, Bob. Yeah, it's been great. And, and like I was saying uh, to listeners, if you want to catch the entire interview again, if you go to thelearningclinic.ca, that'll be the easiest place to get the, uh, the link to the video. I, I, uh, partners in Research may use it or, or may link uh, we'll later on, but uh, uh, we'll, I'll definitely get you the, the link to your website as well from okay. thelearningclinic.ca. So you're listening to The Learning Clinic. I'm your host, Bob Kerwin. Uh, with me has been Kevin Kugler, the uh, Executive Director of Partners in Research, and in a few minutes we will have Ryan Cooney with the Canadian Youth Golf Alliance in here talking about his program. So thank you for listening to CKLU, and uh, stay tuned.
Well, that was fun.